Good morning. Welcome to today's book talk hosted by the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. It's a pleasure to have you all here. We really appreciate everyone for taking time out of their morning to join us um, and to tune into what we hope will be a very interesting conversation. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Iman Ferris. I am the Director of Advocacy here at the Institute, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion with our esteemed guest speaker and also our student panelists. If this is your first time hearing about us or joining um, one of our forums, to give you a little bit of background on the Institute, we are a research and action center based in Harlem at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And um, a lot of our work focuses on providing evidence to help inform local policies um, that we hope will build a healthy and just food system all across New York City. Um, we have a number of projects that address a wide variety of um, of food policy related issues from, you know, how can we help improve the jobs in the food sector to how can we reduce food insecurity and everything else in between. And so as a director of advocacy, my work primarily involves working with CUNY students all across um, the 25 campuses to help advocate for improved campus food policies and also food environments. Um, over the last several months, I've had the pleasure of working with a number of students, faculty and staff to help build our CUNY campaign for healthy food, also known as CUNY Chef. Um, and maybe Rosita, we can drop uh, the link to our website in the chat. Um, but we've really been working on bringing students, staff, and faculty together who are interested in making healthy and nutritious food and beverages the easy choice on campus and also an affordable option for students. Um, I'm happy to share that I'm joined today by two of, the, uh, two of my students, uh, Molly, who is finishing up her first year at CUNY Law, and then also Heidi, who is graduating this semester with her MPH from the CUNY School of Public Health. They've both been working um, alongside, like I said, a number of other students as CUNY chef advocates over the last two semesters to help raise awareness and inform the CUNY community about our own university's contracts with um, different junk food industries. And so there are two things that we've learned. One is that junk food is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and that it's also heavily, heavily marketed. And we know this both from research, um, which we'll touch on uh, today during our discussion, um, but also our own lived experiences. If you know, you're anywhere on campus, you will probably find a number of vending machines trying to sell you ultra processed and sugary snacks, um, sodas, juices, um, and especially if you're in New York City, it's really hard to walk down any you know, New York City block without being bombarded with some sort of advertisement. And so through our campaign work, we've learned a lot about how junk food industries and big soda industries have integrated themselves into communities um, and position themselves as allies and invested stakeholders, which kind of blurs the line um, in terms of our relationship with them. And so I'm very excited to dive into this topic further and also explore how this is happening beyond our campus and beyond New York City, but also across the world. Um, so we will be in conversation with author and professor Dr. Eduardo Gomez, who wrote the book that we'll be discussing today, Junk Food Politics, How Beverage and Fast Food Industries Are Reshaping Emerging Economies. In the book, uh, Dr. Gomez uncovers an interesting public health paradox that's been emerging in developing nations. Um, despite governments making public commitments to wanting to eradicate uh, preventative, um, eradicating uh, non-communicable diseases caused by an unhealthy diet, we still see that sugary beverage and fast food industries are thriving. And hopefully today we can answer the question why. In his book, he provides a number of case studies for Mexico, Brazil, India, China, and Indonesia, exploring the tactics used by the junk food industry to impede on any public health initiatives that might possibly restrict or limit the sales um, or marketing of their products. Um, he provides examples in his book on how these industries have, for example, manipulated scientific research by working with academic allies, um, how they've gained public and even presidential popularity uh, by contributing financially to anti-government, I mean, um, to anti-poverty uh, or anti-hunger uh, campaigns, and then also how they created their own support bases um, by providing things like jobs and community services, especially in high need neighborhoods. And so without any further ado, I want to invite invite uh, Dr. Eduardo Gomez to the stage to share more about his findings and share more about his book. And we will return for the second half of the discussion, which will be a Q&A. So just make sure to jot down any questions that come up during his presentations. And hopefully we will be able to uh, get to it um, during the second half of the discussion. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Gomez. 
Thank you very much, Iman. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining uh, me this uh, morning and taking the time to listen to my about my research in this book. Uh, this book, I can remember almost the day of when the idea of this book emerged. And it was uh, back when I was working in London at King's College London, and I started to realize uh, that I'd been working on obesity policies in Mexico for a while, realizing that Mexico and Brazil were doing a lot of innovative policies to address this situation. But, uh, in, but we're still seeing an increase in childhood obesity and type two diabetes in the population, despite a bunch of different preventative measures the government was taking. At the same time, I had come across an article at a cafe uh, in New York Times in 2016, talking about how powerful the food industry was in the US with regards to research on the connection between the consumption of sugary products and heart disease. And I was really startled to see how powerful industry was in shaping the science and discussions about the connections between sugar consumption and heart disease. And so I started to realize that maybe these challenges in Mexico and Brazil and in emerging economies on prevention programs and awareness programs not working, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe there are other actors that I haven't considered. As a political scientist, I've always focused on government officials, political parties, uh, presidents, decentralization, but it never really dawned on me, well, how about industry as an actor in itself? And how is it becoming a political actor in itself? And I started to wonder, well, how I see that it's happening in the US, it's happened for a long time. Is it happening in the emerging middle income countries that I focus on and focus on in my career? So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for my presentation. That's sort of the backdrop of the whole uh, reason why I started uh, this project. Hope that everyone can see that now. And so the title of my book is Junk Food Politics, How Beverage and Fast Food Industries Are Reshaping Emerging Economies. And again, uh, if we take a look around the world, all of us studying public health and non-communicable disease know that the prevalence of obesity among children and adolescents between the ages of five and 19 is burgeoning throughout the world. And this data from the WHO shows that it's increasing dramatically in the Americas. Sorry, is... Eduardo, can you yeah. please share again your screen? I don't think we can see it. Oh, sorry about that. No worries. Oh, Thank you. Good. There we go. I forgot to hit the share screen. That that will help. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Let me just start from the play from the uh, start. Okay. Perfect. Can you okay. see that? Okay, great. Thank you. And so, uh, as I was mentioning, we know and have known for a long time that childhood obesity is increasing dramatically throughout the world, as we can see here in the Americas. Uh, it includes Canada. Um, uh, uh, the U.S. and South America, that it's growing at a higher rate than most other regions throughout the world. However, the WHO stated in 2020 that the vast majority of overweight or obese children live in developing nations where the rate of increase has been more than 30 percent higher than that of developed countries. So we often think when we hear about childhood obesity that it's in the U.S., right, richer nations, that this is a problem. But in fact, it's in the emerging middle income countries that we're seeing a lot of this, this challenge. And if we look here at data provided by the World Obesity Federation in 2019, countries predicted to have over 1 million obese school-aged children and youth in 2030, China, India, and the US rank in the top 10, and this list goes on further. But what do you notice about all these countries on this list? Well, with the exception of the US, all of these countries are high growth emerging middle income countries, right? They are not industrialized nations in the West or other wealthier countries. So this is really startling and it really points to, and confirms what the WHO has said that it's in the emerging middle income countries that we're seeing the highest growth of childhood obesity and adolescent obesity. But we're also seeing an increase in type two diabetes in young adults and adolescents uh, globally, if you look at from 2003 to 2013, uh, this data provided by Lascar in 2017 shows that globally in the world that type 2 diabetes among young adults and adolescents increased dramatically. If you look again in rising low and middle income countries, it's Africa, um, uh, uh, it's 
it's uh, Southeast Asia and Western Pacific that have seen the highest rates of growth. And so this is very startling, especially when you consider that for many years, people with type, it was perceived that type two diabetics are mainly in older generations, older populations, but now we're seeing it at a younger age. And so how has the World Health Organization responded? And as we all know, the WHO is there to provide us with information and awareness about global pandemics. It provides information to countries and recommendations. And the World Health Organization took a very aggressive stance on this issue. It's very interesting because the WHO has partnered with private industry. So for example, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria uh, uh, with the Gates Foundation and other private entities in the past to address health issues. But in 2016, the WHO director, Margaret Chan, made, made a very bold statement, which I start my book with. And she stated at a National Academy of Medicine that when crafting preventative strategies, government officials must recognize that widespread occurrence of obesity and diabetes throughout our population is not a failure of individual willpower to resist fats and sweets or exercise more. It is a failure of political will to take on powerful economic operators like the food and soda industries. If governments understand this duty, the fight against obesity and diabetes can be won. The interests of the public must be prioritized over those of corporations. And that's a very bold statement, calling it a duty for governments to take on these powerful enterprises. But have governments taking on that duty? Well, unfortunately, in my book, I say that no. And the situation appears to be getting worse in countries such as Mexico, Brazil, India, Indonesia, China, and South Africa, which is the focus of this book. So what were the research questions that motivated this book? Well, first, um, after the implementation of several impressive non-communicable disease and prevention policies, such as ob uh, obesity public awareness campaigns by the government, even soda taxes, why have governments not implemented effective industry regulations, such as improved food labels, advertisings, and sales restrictions? Why are children and the poor disproportionately affected by the absence of effective regulations? And how can a political science, how can political science theory be combined with health policy literature to provide and understand and explain this problem? As a political scientist, I was very much interested in what the literature on in, uh, interest groups, on institutional change, uh, how can that be integrated with the health policy literature on the commercial determinants of health? And so I was really interested in that specific issue. What I argue in this book is that in a context of fear and opportunity, fear of sales declining in the Western industrialized nations, and opportunity to invest in emerging middle income countries, major soda and ultra processed food companies are shaping politics, policy, and society in their favor and influencing policy. But at the same time, influential presidential leaders are working closely with these industries to achieve alternative social welfare, anti-poverty and hunger campaigns and economic agendas. So we have to understand that junk food politics is a two-way street. For many years, we have to, we've been blaming industry uh, for their actions. And of course, we, you know, that is part of the problem. But at the same time, we have to be aware that in emerging middle-income countries, a lot of the problems come from presidential offices and powerful political leaders who are viewing and working with these industries to achieve alternative social welfare and anti-hunger campaigns and advance their political careers. So how did I go about doing this research? Well, I did something that's very different in the field of public health, and a lot of medical historians have done this, of course. I did a comparative historical case study analysis of several emerging economies, Mexico, Brazil, India, Indonesia, China, and South Africa. But why these countries? Well, I chose them because they are countries with the highest rates of obesity and type two diabetes in their region uh, among these types of countries. I selected for diversity and regional representation with Latin America, Asia, and Africa and tried to get as many countries as I could. And of course, I was very sad that I couldn't include a lot of other countries, but you know, it's very hard to go in depth on case studies, doing all as many countries as possible. 
Um, I also chose these countries because there was a lot of extensive public research and data on these countries. So as I always tell my students, excuse me, you always wanna choose countries where there's a lot of data and evidence so that you can see the different kinds of arguments. And so there was a lot of information that had been published on these countries. And that was one of the reasons why I selected them. But I also selected them to illustrate the potential utility of my analytical explanatory framework, which I'll explain in a moment. I used qualitative documents, primary and secondary literature, global health databases from the WHO, and did interviews with NGO leaders, activists, academic and policy experts from 2019 to 2021. So what was my theoretical approach? Well, as a political scientist, I started to investigate how political science theory, commercial determinants of health literature can be integrated to provide an analytical framework that helps to explain uh, these ongoing challenges. And this framework that I explain in the book starts with the broader historical context of fear and opportunity, where industries are again are fearful of losing uh, revenue in emerging middle income countries, I'm sorry, advanced industrialized nations as more and more people become aware of the nutritional harm of certain foods and opportunity to invest in other countries. We then get to the independent variables, the causes, uh, one being political action of policy partnerships of industries working with government to address obesity and diabetes, lobbying and largies, institutional infiltration when industries find their way within government through representatives, but also restructuring society. And in this book, I emphasize how industries are engaging civil society and finding social allies through corporate social responsibility tactics, engaging in uh, you know, uh, health and education campaigns and human rights campaigns and gay rights campaigns, such as seen as Brazil, as I'll talk about that later. Partnering with NGOs and academics that are like-minded, but also how this leads to a divided society with industry partnering with civil societal actors and academics how that takes away the opportunity for activists concerned about children's health and the poor's health to work with them and create a more collective response. This then, these activities then lead to industry legitimacy and policy influence, so ultimately the ineffectiveness or absence of ND, NCD regulatory policy. And the intervening variable here called complementary institutions, this is when presidents strategically work with industry to achieve their alternative social welfare and political agendas. And that complements and adds to the legitimacy and influence of industry. And this analytical framework is used to really explain, uh, hopefully more in depth, what is going on in these countries and we, what we can learn from them. Now, let me talk about the fear and opportunity. And there's a chapter dedicated to this topic. And we have to understand the broader historical context. So why are these industries going to the emerging economies in the first place? Why is that the focus of these companies in recent years? Well, first has to do with fear of declining sales in the US, um, Western Europe, fear of nutritional knowledge and awareness in the West. I've been really shocked and surprised and, and happy to see a lot of young people in college having second thoughts about what they're eating on campus. The other day I was on campus at Lehigh and overheard some students questioning if they should eat a cookie or not, you know, talking about the calories on that cookie. And I remember in college many years ago when I was in school, I never even thought about that. So there is a greater awareness and knowledge of youth and the population in general about the harms of these foods. Now, the opportunity is different in, in, in emerging middle-income countries. We have new market opportunities for these investments uh, from these companies, the demand for popular foreign junk foods, um, and there's a social status with this. So in a lot of Asian countries that I talk about in my book, especially China, there is a high social status going to KFC and McDonald's. And in fact, people go there for popular ceremonies and family members, which is something very different from here in the West. There's a rising middle income class and there's anti-poverty cash transfer programs that are very politically popular where families now have more income and can purchase cheaper foods that are more accessible in cities, but also now in rural areas. And there's a delayed public awareness in emerging middle income countries about the linkages of food and nutrition. And I wanted to give an example of the opportunity and sort of the, the investment strategies 
we all know Coca-Cola, for example, its international investments are vast throughout the world. And not surprised for those of you that study the soda industry, the Center for Science and Public Interest provided this graph. This is very nice and very telling how Coca-Cola's biggest investments in look inside it globally has actually been in Mexico. And there's a lot of um, it, it for particular countries. Uh, and there's a lot of history, and I'll talk about that later, but Coca-Cola's investments vast throughout all of the world as one of the leading soda companies investing in other countries. But if we look at opportunity, and as an example of what I talk about, uh, this is a Nestle at the Rosé floating boat that uh, Nestle did this for many years and they'll stop doing this recently. And this boat used to travel throughout the Brazilian Amazons, providing Nestle products to indigenous communities and poor communities throughout the Amazons. And so it's really shocking to see this, but not surprising. In fact, the first time I talked about this, it was on a BBC show several years ago. And the editor emailed me the next day and said, you know, we really can't believe what you talked about. Is it really true? And I had to show evidence of this happening in Brazil. This was before Nestle stopped doing this. And this is just one example of several that I talk in the book where industries are trying to reach and find opportunity in the most rural parts of developing nations. So how have governments responded? What has been the policy response? Well, in the book, I talk about how all countries are implemented impressive prevention campaigns, informing the public about childhood obesity and diabetes. They've done a good job of monitoring obesity and diabetes and risk factors, encouraging exercise and healthy lifestyles. Some governments have created sugary beverage taxes, Mexico, India, and South Africa, but not in Indonesia, Brazil, and China. The WHO has recently stated that it's in developing countries where we're seeing national soda taxes as sort of leading the world in that endeavor. However, most have not created effective food labels, marketing and sales regulations. Mexico and Brazil came the closest on advertising and sales regulations. But as I talk about in my book and I document, a lot of these policies have not really been enforced, especially with regards to selling these products in schools. But China, Indonesia, South Africa, and India still have no advertising and sales regulations as we have similar in the US and instead, have relied on industry pledges and self-regulations and promises not to advertise to children. Mexico recently launched an improved food labels and adopted uh, Chile's Black Octagon food labels uh, and has just recently done that. In fact, my research on Mexico stopped right about a year or two before Mexico achieved that. And I can talk a little more about that later. But no other countries that I looked at in my book have implemented this kind of innovative, improved food labels on their products. However, prevention campaigns and taxes, I argue, are not enough. We need these effective regulations on advertising, sales, and marketing. And why has this happened? And it has to do with industry's political actions, where specifically I look at policy partnerships, lobbying, and what I call institutional infiltration. Uh, industry partnerships, working with government to create effective food labels and to reformulate uh, and improve the quality of food. We saw this uh, with industry in Brazil. Uh, uh, industry has partnered with governments in India on improving food safety regulation. For example, how do we regulate the quality of food sold on streets and street vendors? Industry has also worked uh, to improve nutritional education uh, in schools in China, South Africa, and India, Coca-Cola. But also we've seen partnerships with government in Mexico, China, and South Africa on um, exercise programs in schools, and that being a priority for a lot of these governments. But industries also provided health services, school sanitation, water conservation, and partnership with local governments. Uh, to achieve this as we saw with India and Coca-Cola. Industry representatives have also lobbied the Congress and the bureaucracy to, de to delay legislation or uh, regulations, either through direct lobbying or through rep representative industry associations. And we saw this in South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, and India, but not as much in China or Indonesia. That's not really being documented and discussed that much in these countries. But what interesting finding uh, is what I call and what others have called in political science is institutional infiltration. 
And this is, I think, a very clandestine effort and very effective, one of the most effective strategies that, that, that these uh, industries have. And that is by working through industry representatives that are present within health agencies to introduce, introduce their ideas and to build support. And here I give the example of the International Life Sciences Institute in China and the wonderful work by Susan Granholm at Harvard who has documented this work in China and how Eastly, which was founded by Coca-Cola in the 1970s and the China division of Eastly um, had officials within the Ministry of Health that were actually the director of the Eastly China and how Eastly through their connections in the Ministry of Health basically wrote all of China's policy on childhood obesity with an, uh, prevention with an emphasis on exercise, right? So I talk about in my book, for example, in 2008, the Childhood the Sunshine Act, which is a national uh, ministry of health and education mandate that all schools require that children's, children run for one hour in the morning prior to school, right? And this was a countrywide mandate through all schools. And having read when I was doing my research, translated articles in Xinhua, the newspapers, parents were very upset about this, how this would affect their, make them tired. But it was a, an indication of how committed the government was and how powerful this idea was that arguably was, influ, was uh, introduced through Eastlay about the importance of exercise rather than addressing marketing and sales and nutritional content of foods in schools. We saw this similar institutional filtration strategy uh, in Brazil with a Brazil Isli and then Visa when it came to advertising of these products to the population and how easily representatives within and Visa working groups emphasizing and questioning the Ministry of Health's um, responsibility in this and, and saying that it was not the ministry's responsibility, but the Congress and sort of delaying this process. But we also saw in Mexico, um, the former OMENT, which was a uh, an advisory uh, group within the government on NCD programs, which no longer exists, but it was there present for many years, where industry representatives were there trying to influence obesity policy uh, throughout uh, society. Now, another tactic that industry has taken that I talk about, uh, and I think is very, very powerful is what I call restructuring society, engaging in corporate social responsibility tactics, industry, civil societal ties, and created a divided society. And we all know all the vast literature on corporate social responsibilities that we've seen in the tobacco industry, and now we've seen in the food and beverage sector. And this has been done to uh, increase uh, in response to public criticisms, these activities are, uh, are been done to contribute to society and increase the business reputation, right? These CSR uh, activities have been present in all the countries that I looked at uh, in this book. In Brazil, with Nestle's employment programs for women, Coca-Cola's gay pride campaigns, as I'll talk about briefly. We saw in India as well, I'll talk about briefly, Coca-Cola's splash bars are providing uh, employment for women in rural areas and little places, uh, you know, little bars or kiosks where they can sell a shot of Coca-Cola, very cheap. We saw in Indonesia, uh, Coca-Cola providing free medical services. In South Africa, Nestle job trading with HIV AIDS and even Nestle providing a community nutrition awards to recognizing those that are fighting to reduce hunger and malnutrition. And all these activities increase these industries' social and political legitimacy. But industry is also providing funding to NGOs and academic researchers. And we saw this in Mexico, Brazil, and China, and building social ties through these activities. But as I talk about in my book, and, and, as, I, uh, and as I show with, with uh, interviews from various um, activists, these efforts have really divided society in the sense that industries working with partnerships uh, with academics, prestigious academics and researchers and, and think tanks, how that limits the number of activists or number of individuals in society that activists can work with to create a greater civic mobilization and response to these activities. And so that's sort of a, a, a challenge that I found all throughout my book. Now, here are some examples of the CSR campaigns. Uh, for example, Coca-Cola during the International LGBTQ Pride Day created a special Coca-Cola uh, 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 can, um, which 
For many years, um, uh, Coke is a Fanta, it was a derogatory term used towards the gay community. Uh, and it, uh, what Coca-Cola did was create a can that had Fanta, which is a soda product with, within a regular Coca-Cola. And they said that Coca-Cola is a Fanta and so what? And so it was a, it was a image uh, to, in solidarity with the gay community and of, of acceptance of the gay community. And this was a major symbol that, they, that activists used during the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the great, uh, Gay Pride Day in Brazil. Uh, we had India and Coca-Cola splash bars or uh, Coca-Cola's provided um, women in rural areas with these splash bars so where you can buy a shot of Coca-Cola at a very cheap price with the goal of empowering women and providing them with opportunities to have their own business and giving them a voice within their communities. We saw in Brazil, the Nestle at the Bose vendor program, which the New York Times has written and published about where this image comes from, uh, where uh, women go throughout the different favelas in Brazil selling uh, Nestle products, similar to what we saw with the uh, floating boats in the Amazons. And through this, providing food, but also uh, discussing social issues and health issues that families have. And through these endeavors, really providing legitimacy to families and seeing Nestle as something good in their lives. And finally, another CSR activity is South Africa's Coca-Cola's Project Last Mile, which builds on Coca-Cola's expertise in, in um, supply and cold chain technology and, and their, their, technolo their technology in, in reaching rural areas. And that's something that we've seen a lot in Africa um, uh, happen. At the same time, in my book, I talk about that while industries have done a lot, obviously, and then it sort of contributed to the problem, another area are political institutions, specifically presidents and what I call complementary institutions. They are also part of the problem, right? They're also contributing to this uh, challenge. And I look at three different things. I look at presidents' historic connections with industry and how this provides industry with access to policymakers and support. So I talk about uh, the case of Mexico and Pre President Vicente Fox as a former Coca-Cola director prior to becoming president. And of course, it opened a lot of doors for Coca-Cola while, while uh, President Fox was in office. I talk about the current president in South Africa, uh, uh, Cecil Ramaphosa who uh, was in government, left government for a long period of time, started his own consulting firm and actually started to invest in McDonald's and even owns a Coca-Cola bottling plant and how this connection has sort of allowed industry is sort of in many ways allowed to have some influence with the government and sort of limited policies. Um, but also another uh, issue that I talk about a lot is presidents using industry to achieve alternative social welfare and economic goals. And so I talk, um, um, uh, for example, with a case of Brazil, uh, with the current president Lula, who was a president uh, for two for two uh, administrations in the past. And then we had the Bolsonaro administration. Lula has now come back in office, and Lula has always been committed to. Uh, fighting uh, poverty and hunger and created a very, um, very uh, powerful and, and influential program called Zero Fome, which eradicates hunger all throughout Brazil. And this Zero Fome um, was a broader umbrella program <clears throat> that focused on eradicating hunger and providing job opportunities and income. And under this Zero Fome, initiative, we had the Bolsa Familia program that is a cash transfer program that provides uh, uh, money to families in exchange for uh, their children having getting vaccinations and going to schools. Well, Nestle was a big partner in helping Lula achieve this Xenofome uh, endeavor. And in fact, the government under Lula provided Xenofome Hunger Program Partnership Certificate to Nestle. And Nestle was the first one in receiving this recognition of helping Lula achieve this Zero Fome endeavor. In India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's partnership with Nestle to support farmers and agricultural production. Uh, and also in South Africa, Rafa Fosa has worked closely with industry to provide jobs and economic growth. We also saw this in China and Indonesia as well. But presidents go beyond, and in some cases also build institutions to secure their partnership. And in the case of Brazil, for example, under Lula, his presidential office created the specific coordinator of business mobilization advisory office in the presidential palace 
with its goal to establish partnerships with industry to help achieve the uh, Zero Fome endeavor and other social welfare and also uh, job opportunity endeavors. But what didn't help, of course, is a lot of the social imaging where presidents in these countries have gone in public to demonstrate their partnership with these uh, companies. And if you can see here, this image taken by Taylor in 2018 with Mexico's Vincente Fox enjoying a fresh Coca-Cola beverage uh, in public, President Lula and uh, opening a Nestle plant in Bahia and increasing job opportunities. And that was part of the uh, Zero Fome initiative, the, the uh, effort to eradicate poverty, seeing Nestle as a, being a partner and providing job opportunities as well. As well. We have some uh, South Africa's Ramaphosa uh, being pictured here with McDonald's executives. Um, and sort of you know that, what that image entails and what that shows to society and also uh, India's Modi working with or meeting with Pepsi's former C India's former CEO Indra Noyi, who, as I talk about in the book, was very committed to working with Modi on helping farmers and agricultural production and achieving uh, Modi's agricultural development um, uh, endeavors. I also want to talk about the role of civil society in these emerging middle income countries. Here in the US, you know, we have uh, students, we have activists working on childhood obesity, on nutrition, but we have to remember that this is very new in a lot of emerging and middle income countries, right? The social movement of defense of children and the poor's health is new, especially with respect to obesity and type two diabetes. And there are of course exceptions, Brazil and Mexico has done wonders in terms of more recent years, 10 to, 10 to 15 years in having activists that are very committed to this endeavor and ensuring awareness and information. Um, but NGOs, activists and researchers in India, China, Indonesia, South Africa, they don't have as much financial support and capacity and political support. And that's and their effort to raise awareness of these issues is very new. And so there's a great disparity across the world in terms of history of activism, but also uh, resources and political support. We have to keep that in mind. Civil so society is gradually finding the support that they need, mainly from international partners. And one great example is the Bloomberg Foundation, who has provided a lot of support in Mexico to help activists raise awareness about the importance of soda taxes. And that's one example of what uh, foundations can do to support the work of nutrition activists in other countries. And we certainly need a lot more international domestic support for activists in these countries. But let me conclude with some uh, major uh, bullet points. First, a political science approach to the commercial determinants of health can provide an alternative explanations to ongoing power and influence of junk food industry. So what I did in this book is, you know, this is an academic book that really starts with, has a lot of theory and about interest groups and institutions and, and corporate social responsibility. And my goal was to provide a framework that can illustrate the benefits of political science and its merger with the commercial determinants of health literature to provide new questions that can guide our ability to explain in more depth what's happening in these emerging middle-income countries. And so um, I'm hope, my hope is that other social scientists will engage in the similar kind of research to, to, to explain these issues in these countries. But, we, but I also want to emphasize that junk food politics is a two-way street. And so while we, you know, we're quick to blame industry and, and of course, all the, all, the, all the tactics that they do, we also often have to remember that government is also to blame, that presidents and their ambitions um, are often, um, you know, causing more harm. Uh, by partnering with these major industries to achieve alternative social welfare objectives. And while, they're, while their intentions may be good, they don't realize the broader legitimacy that these partnerships give with industry and how it's contributing to the problem. And that is why I, I talk about at the end how leadership is very, very important in these emerging middle income countries. Presidents and prime ministers in these countries, because these democracies are new, have had a, a much more impact in government in society because of the absence of democracy for so many years in the past. 
And so presidents are seen as major leaders, have a lot of influence in the general setting, and they cannot afford to partner with major industries because this provides uh, industry legitimacy and de-incentivizes regulation, right? Regulation of these advertising and sales policies. In addition to political and policy manipulation, industries are also dividing society and hampering its ability to mobilize an opposition to industry and influence policy. So we have to really question how these corporate social responsibility activities, how industries partnership with academics um, and, and sponsoring different nutritional conferences, which still unfortunately is happening in other countries, and how that's hampering civil society's ability to mobilize and how activists can't find other partners to align with in response to these industry activities. And finally, governments, governments need to view taking on the power of industries, achieving what WTO Director, Director Chan called, said as a call to duty, and imposing regulatory policies as a means to bolstering their international reputation and health. We saw this with HIV AIDS, as I talked about in my previous book, Geopolitics and Health. Countries um, can benefit by introducing in, in innovations in HIV AIDS policy, showing the world that they are committed to eradicating AIDS and have the ability and the commitment to do so. Now they have an opportunity, these emerging economies, to show the world that they are politically committed to their children and the poor and protecting them from foods that are harmful to their health. And, um, and a sign of a truly emerging economy is one that is placing and prioritizing the health of their most vulnerable populations and using policy innovations in regulations uh, to show how committed they are. And I'm hoping in the future that these industries will begin to realize that, you know, that this is important globally and they can have an opportunity to show the world what they are doing to achieve this as you know, several countries did with HIV AIDS in the past. So that is my, the, uh, my book and a snapshot. And as someone that you know, works a lot in history of, of health and, and all the details, I'm always sad that I co can't go into all of the juicy details and case studies of these book, up in this book. But I, I hope that uh, for those of you that bought the book uh, are reading through the case studies and all the details that I have in there. And uh, I really uh, appreciate the time that you spent today listening to the book. And I look forward to uh, discussing with you and, and answering some questions. So, Thank you. Yes, Iman? Yes. Should I, should I stop the share screen now? Uh, yes, yes, please. I think you can. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Eduardo uh, Gomez, for that insightful overview of your book. Um, now we're going to turn it over to the Q&A portion of our discussion. And um, I was hoping that I would start off with one question, and I would pass it along to my student panelists, um, Heidi and then Molly. So I wanna kind of bring back two things that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, one, which you just mentioned, like junk food politics is a two-way street. And then also the quote um, of WHO, Dr. Chan, uh, Chan, the interests of the public must be prioritized over those of corporations. Um, and so in the book, you talk a lot and in your, in your presentation too, you, you kind of stated how junk food industries have tried to position themselves as allies of the government, how they're also interested in safeguarding vulnerable populations' health. They want to be a part of the solution, essentially. Um, but obviously, we know that they have an underlying agenda, whether that's, you know, number one, to prevent further regulation um, that might happen in, in terms of like restricting the sales of their products or to also redirect attention and, and put blame somewhere else. Um, an example that you gave in the book that stood out to me was people need to exercise more. And you mentioned that with the mandate in China. Um, and so I think we can all agree that the industry's goal is not altruistic altogether. However, I also want to pose the question and um, in what you said, junk food politics is a two way street. Can we trust that the government is 100% altruistic and has the interest of its people as a top priority? And like in this quote, putting the interest of the people um, over corporations. And I asked that because in the case study on Mexico, I thought, it was really interesting that they were the first country to pass a national soda tax and the snack tax that was passed in 2014, and that it was successful because it was kind of sold in this national uh, fiscal package. It was more of a you know broader economic package rather than focusing on the public health aspect of it. 
And um, in addition to the soda tax, there were other preventative measures that you also talked about, um, laws that prohibited junk food advertising on TV, especially during the hours that children watch television, um, you know, requiring companies to put food labels, setting nutritional standards in schools that would help eliminate the sales of ultra processed foods. Um, however, which you kind of also mentioned in your in your presentation, when they were doing the evaluation of how effective these regulations were, we found that um, a lot of them were actually not being monitored or enforced, especially the ones with the nutritional standards in the schools. And so that kind of forced me to ask the question, oh, but even though the other regulations weren't being um, heavily enforced, the soda taxes were. That was being implemented. The government collected a ton of revenue um, through that. And so that kind of just made me question, you know, how invested is the government actually in a comprehensive preventative approach to reducing non-communicable diseases and protecting the health of um, vulnerable populations? Or do they, similar to the junk food industry, see this as an opportunity to also raise revenue? And, you know, was that a pattern that you noticed in your other case studies where you know, they're coming out with all these regulations and solutions, but it's really only the, only the soda tax that's being um, effectively implemented. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Iman. That's a great question. And we have to look at the comprehensive, right, all of the policies. I think that's a very good question. We have to remember that the soda tax is one possible solution. We have to look at regulations. We have to look at enforcement of regulations and why that's not happening. And that really is telling something about the commitment of government, right? In the case of Mexico, it was a very challenging because what happened in Peña Nieto was a divided government. And Peña Nieto was sort of, uh, had a divide, a coalition that had to work with it, right? So I believe that there were mixed motives, right? On one hand, there certainly was the economic motive of the tax, which we saw in other countries. Um, and also, um, you know, not only, but also there was a gradual interest in health. And he was also very much interested in the health issue. But the political feasibility of getting the tax passed was really the only feasible way was really to market it as an economic issue rather than a health issue. And to really dovetail it with the broader fiscal reforms that were happening at the time. So while one could argue there, there's mixed motives, while one could argue certainly there was an economic incentive and in using that uh, funding to also invest in schools and, and water fountains, there was also an interest in health. In fact, Peña Nieto went in public um, and, and in the news talking about the obesity problem later on in his administration and talking about how Mexicans need to change their culture and their diet. And so uh, there was sort of a mixed motive, but as you, as, you as you stated and I explained in the book, there was very little political will, right? There was very little political will in enforcement of these, uh, these policies in schools of creating institutions that monitor if schools are adhering to the national policies about you know, selling and providing nutritious foods. And so that does tell us that there were the, the, the political will and commitment was lagging under the Peña administration. Now, one thing that has changed a lot in Mexico that I haven't been able to talk about because uh, my research stopped, right, uh, as the new AMLO government came in, is that the AMLO government has pretty much changed completely the government's relationship with uh, Coca-Cola and, and these industries and in, in basically several ways. One is by going public and questioning and stating that these beverages are bad for you, something that was never done in Mexico in the past. And I think that builds on the awareness within civil society and activists about this issue and the president realizing that this is something very harmful. And I think COVID-19 actually had you know, accelerated that realization. But also the wonderful work by activists in working with government to adopt new food labeling legislation in 2021 and sort of also the president's commitment to conflict of interest reducing corruption. And so the polit political climate has changed dramatically. Now, I haven't been following the issue of policy enforcement very recently, um, and that's something that needs to be looked at, but, but I think that, that the, the political climate has changed. The only concern in Mexico is that it's there's no presidential re-election. So we're, we're worried about what will happen with the next president because the next president could decide to change completely. And this is one of the drawbacks of a democracy, right? Is that presidents leave office and then we have to worry about the next president being as committed. The Obamas were certainly very, very committed to uh, the let's move campaign, right? And we see a change in leadership and that's no longer the case. So, um, but I think you're absolutely right. Other countries, 
Um, this has been, the, there's been mixed motives. In South Africa, there was a mixed motive about the soda tax seen as economic, but also a health issue. Uh, but we have to, um, um, you know, look at to what extent, um, you know, is the government really committed to health? And um, I would say this, the tax is a step in the right direction. But unfortunately, I don't see in my countries that I talk about a fully committed government, uh, especially when it comes to these presidential partnerships that is very, that is placing the needs of vulnerable populations first. Um, so yes, but thank you for that question. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to pass it to the student panelists, um, Heidi, and then uh, Molly, you can ask your question after. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hello. I have a question. <laughs> the cost of obesity and um, NCDs, which is non-communicable diseases, to people and governments is estimated over $800 billion worldwide, and that was reported by Harvard in 2016. So what is your opinion on whether governments, foreign and domestic, should allow, and I love your term, the formation of industry and complementary institutions when it comes to junk food and SSBs, and SSBs being sugary sweetened beverages? And if and when they do, what types of non-communicable disease prevention policies could or should be implemented in your opinion? Yes. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. That's a great question. As, and as I, as I pointed out at the very beginning of the presentation, obesity and diabetes are certainly skyrocketing in these countries, in developing countries. The WHO says that we've seen the greatest growth in these countries. And I think that what governments need to do is really re-question the presidents and these complementary institutions need to question their partnerships with these industries, especially now more than ever. And um, you know, I talk about this in my book and the recent uh, article in Think Global Health. Um, and the reason is because partnerships um, give legitimacy to these corporations, right? And give legitimacy to their presence. And, uh, and that sends mixed signals to society, right? And so while their while they're anti-hunger campaigns are certainly admirable, uh, perhaps they should consider partnering with other industries that could achieve something similar, right? And, and so that's sort of one of the things that needs to be considered. And it goes, and it goes in, and, and next with regards to NCD prevention, um, I think my book's really policies, I think my book really emphasizes that soda taxes are not enough and that um, the other, you know, regulatory initiatives, um, you know, and especially on advertising and sales, uh, we haven't seen it with the exception of Mexico uh, and Brazil tried to do this was not successful. Uh, no other country, Indonesia, China, South Africa, uh, India has tried to address this issue. And uh, now that children are online all the time and social media, this is becoming even more and more important, right? And so, but as I talk about in my book, this is a line that a lot of governments are afraid to cross because when it comes to advertising and sales, that's something industries really are very passionate about. They're okay with the soda taxes. They realize people are still gonna purchase sodas and consume, uh, although we saw in Mexico that it is contributing to a de decline in consumption, but, you know, certainly do not, you know, affect our ability to sell our products and to market it. We have a constitutional right, right? We have a right to do that, right? And so that's really been the dividing line that governments are afraid. And that's what Margaret Chan was saying. And I think that's really the heart of the, of the, of the matter and, and where a lot of industry has its power is finding these alternative uh, ways to advertise. To, and social media is one of them. I didn't talk about it a lot in my book, but I think that's something in my class in the commercial determinants of health. Dr. Gomez, your screen has frozen. I don't know if you can hear me. Is that the same thing on your end, Heidi and Molly? Okay, cool. Um, just give us one moment. Yeah, I think Dr. Gomez will rejoin uh, Hiller to this that his connection is um, intermittent sometime. Um, so please bear with us uh, uh, a few moments. Thank you.
My, my apologies, everyone. I lost internet connection. I was afraid this was going to happen. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, this does happen from time to time in my home office here. The internet connection isn't that great. Um, and so, um, um, and so what I was saying is that you know, we really the comprehensive Heidi, you know, going to your question, uh, Heidi, there needs to be a comprehensive approach. And this goes back to uh, Iman's question on introducing these innovations or regulations uh, with regards to NCDs and that sort of taxes are not the only, only answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you again so much for your time. Um, I think similar to everyone here, something that's been in the front of my brain um, as I was reading the book and as you've been speaking is just the real, the utter effectiveness of these, the social influence and marketing that these companies are doing, um, particularly like personally right now, my school does not have any food options on campus other than vending machines, but my undergraduate, um, journey at University of Texas, we had a Wendy's on campus and it was attached to a dorm and it was the highest profiting Wendy's in the United States um, and probably still is because of course this is like the cheap food option. It's open till 4 a.m. for students. Um, and it, I'm just thinking about if we even propose trying to take that away, students would really be upset. Um, and I think also, as we've been talking about soda taxes, I know years ago, New York uh, um, introduced a soda tax for a little bit. And again, growing up in Texas, I remember hearing about it and everybody around me was enraged on behalf of New York City. And that's not even, you know, that it wasn't even directly affecting us. Um, so kind of in the same vein, I was wondering how, um, since most of these major companies are, American or just from a westernized country like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, Nestle, everything we've been talking about. Um, I wanted to know what responsibilities or opportunities you see um, politicians or lawmakers from these western countries um, where these major companies originated um, versus um, politicians from other countries that are being affected by these um, companies. Yes, that's a great uh, question, Molly. It's sort of the moral, or sort of the, the obligation, right, of these uh, of the U.S. and helping other countries. And and I think that that's something that uh, I really didn't think about in my book, and really, uh, and I didn't address. And I think there's a very great question. You know, the argument that a lot of these companies are coming from the U.S. and, and the West, not only the U.S. but also in Italy and other Western industrialized nations. One possibility could be where um, you know. Officials within, um, you know, HHS, um, CDC, or the bureaucracy, or even congressional members that are concerned, uh, really try to work with other countries uh, in raising awareness and establishing conferences, and you know, meeting with not only uh, health officials in these countries but activists, and then reinforcing the importance of including activists and and researchers into policy discussions. I think it is uh, important that the U.S. and other countries show leadership uh, in trying to work with other countries in doing that. We have foundations that are starting to do that work and learning from other countries. You know, the Robert Wood Foundation, for example, learning from other countries and their program. Uh, but I do believe there there needs to be more. Uh, now, you have to remember too that under previous administrations and conservative administrations, that the food lobby inter interest in the U.S. has been extremely powerful. And you remember with the WHO and the national uh, the global dietary guidelines. Um, under the Bush administration, uh, industry is very much opposed to any kind of regulations of the industry and soda taxes. And so there's always been a very strong connection between industry and, 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 and having government officials argue against international guidelines and recommendations. But that doesn't mean that there aren't officials within our government and congressional members that are very passionate about this topic. And so I think it would be a good idea to sort of mobilize them and to work with these countries where progress is being made. And the Americas, Mexico, and Chile are being are now the leaders in addressing this issue. And Chile has a Senate that is fully committed to this issue. And I think that the US senators and congressional members that are interested and health officials could work with them 
um, and, and raising more awareness about this in their countries, but also working with other countries in Latin America and other countries to raise awareness. So I think it's a very interesting and very important point. Um, you know, uh, we, you know, the U.S. is interested in learning from other countries, but I think that we, we do need more, make more of an effort to work with other countries too. And of course, the problem is that we're not a great example in our own country. That's the big problem, right? Um, and I think that, um, you know, that, that's another whole issue and, and, and it really does not give us legitimacy and credibility going to another country and saying, you need to do this and this in advertising and sales and nothing's being done here, right? Or even a national tax and nothing is not happening. Um, and so, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that they, the government, our government can't try to raise, raise awareness about the needs of these policies in other countries. So, but thank you, Molly, that was a great question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the um, the responses so far. And so um, just for the audience to know, the chat is now open uh, to audience questions. And so if you have anything um, that you want to comment or respond to uh, for today's presentation or the book, um, drop it in the chat and we will um, pose it to Dr. Gomez. Um, so our first audience uh, question comes from uh, Nevin. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Can you comment on the subnational opportunities to challenge industry that you have uncovered in your research? Um, so opportunities for cities, for example, roads for public institutions like schools, hospitals, et cetera. Oh, that, Nevin, that's a fantastic question. This is something that I've been recently doing research on. I'm working on an article now in Mexico on subnational innovations. And we're finding that some local governments in Mexico are doing things that the national government has not done well. And one of them is advertising and banning sale of junk foods to children in local areas. And it's in Mexico's local cities uh, where we have seen this kind of effort being done. And I think that, um, and this is important because in Mexico and other emerging middle income countries, a lot of the policy impetus has been at the national level. It's not like the US where the impetus has been at the local level with the soda taxes. But in these countries, even though there is decentralization of healthcare, national ideas about soda taxes and prevention have occurred mainly at the national level. And so what we've seen since COVID-19 has been at the local level in Mexico, a realization that these advertising and sales policies have not been enforced and that local leaders need to take the initiative. Um, and this is the first place where I have seen this kind of effort being done in these countries. And I think a lot more work needs to be done in, in this situation. Um, and, and I think that, uh, and so we can learn a lot from this. And, and, I'm, and I'm looking, I haven't, I just started doing more research on this topic. Uh, it's very limited because the cities that have done this in Mexico are small and, uh, you know, and we'll need, I'll need to go there to do this work. But I think that that's a great point. We need to look at subnational innovations and how activists are working with them and government officials in these specific localities. But I think it is a response to the ineffectiveness of advertising and sales regulations at the national level. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience, Jewel Ann asks, could Dr. Gomez comment whether the public um, and private partnerships for promoting nutrition and physical activity from the, U uh, from the recent US White House conference are consistent with his thesis here, um, where it might be ineffective or harmful or kind of being pushed by industry? Uh, well, I, I haven't really followed this specific uh, initiative, but I, I would question that, you know, the public private partnership, I think that we need to look closely um, at what this entails and sort of which companies are involved and sort of how, again, as I talk about in my book, how this may be legitimizing some of these companies that perhaps mean, uh, you know, that, are, that is sort of questionable to our health. Um, I haven't looked at specific, uh, this initiative, but I think that it's important that, you know, sort of question, you know, these, these sort of partnerships. Definitely. We have to question everything. <laughs> um... So uh, a question that I had also from reading your book is looking at the proposals around the marketing and selling of ultra processed foods, which um, aim to change individual consumption behavior. Um, so when we're talking about soda taxes, we're you know proposing that with hopes of deterring individuals from purchasing the product by making it a little bit more expensive. Um, when we're talking about limiting advertising in schools or you know removing cartoons from cereal boxes, that's to you know decrease awareness from children, re reduce that desire as well. And all of these recommendations essentially have one thing in common. It's 
uh, essentially placing the onus on the individual to have to make good choices. And I, I say that with quotation marks because we know that poor health and nutrition are largely rooted in systemic issues. Um, and you mentioned Chile's success in passing the, um, the black octagon, the food warning labels, kind of telling people that, hey, this product has a lot of sugar, a lot of um, sodium. And um, I was doing a little bit of research kind of in, prepar in preparation for today's discussion. And one of the complaints or one of the things that um, researchers found from um, these food warning labels is that, you know, consumers are educated and they're informed, but everything in the store has a warning label. And so now they have the knowledge, but the environment doesn't necessarily support them uh, to make a healthy decision. And so I wanted to ask, do you think that it would be more effective for the government to target the food industry at large instead of individual behavior? And um, do you know of any attempts or proposals, whether they've been successful and, and or, or not, that would place the burden on the junk food industry to have to improve the quality? the quality and health of their food. So for example, you know, maybe regulations around ingredients or sugar content limitations, or maybe taxing the, the, the ultra processed companies instead of offsetting that, that cost to individual people. Yes, uh, that is a great uh, question, Amara. And I think um, in general, in the countries that I looked at, there has been no government effort to really force industries to improve the ingredients in their in their, in their products. And what I mean by force is by law or penalty. Um, what we have seen in the case of Brazil, I think was a great example of this, are partnerships, voluntary partnerships with industry to improve the quality of their food. So what industry has done um, in several instances is it worked with the Ministry of Health to reduce the salt and sodium and fats in their foods. In 2008, um, the ANVISA, which is the regulatory agency in the Ministry of Health, um, agree, uh, worked with industry to reduce the level of trans fats, uh, trans fatty acids in their foods. And so, but these have mainly been voluntary partnership agreements. They really haven't been enforced by law. What is the problem with that? Well, it doesn't monitor, it doesn't enforce any penalties. And it also, as uh, other, other scholars, uh, Carlos Montiero in Brazil, for example, I talk about in my book, it also detracts and takes away from um, uh, the effort to regulate these industries and seeing these goodwill partnerships and voluntary, voluntarily improving the quality of foods, how that sort of takes away the attention and focus on regulation. Um, and so, uh, but in other countries that I talk about in the book, there was, to my knowledge, no effort to enforce or incentivize improving the quality of the foods. However, in the UK, I think has done a good job of introducing a tax that incentivizes industries to reduce the amount of sugar in their products. So they have a, a tax structure where you're not taxed if, if there's you know, a certain level of, sh uh, of sugar that, you know, as, I think, I, I forget the exact amount of quantity, but anything below that amount is not taxed, but anything above that level is taxed. And so these kinds of fiscal incentive structures could, could possibly work. Uh, in terms of trying to get in the companies to improve the quality of foods ahead of time. But I do think that, you know, that, that there is this question really needs to be uh, looked into and sort of what is government doing to effectively incentivize um, industries to improve the quality of their foods. And I think that's a very good point because, again, like you say, Ron, the, the, the focus has been on information and and, and, and on the consumer. And this is very important. We obviously, obviously do need to equip consumers with more nutrition and more awareness. And that's very important. Uh, and labeling is very important. I mean, it's something that still a lot of work needs to be done in these countries. But at the same time, we really do need to, government needs to play a role in, in sort of product reformulation. Now, why isn't that happening? Well, I would argue that it's one of the reasons why is because Again, these governments being in partnership with these industries, right? And, and seeing this as something harmful to their relationship, you know, that could be one of the main, one of the reasons why we're not seeing this happen. Thank you. And so just to clarify that tax in um, UK that you mentioned, so that's taxing the industry or? Um, yes, the yes taxing the industry, the producers of beverages uh, and the sugar content in their products. Yeah. If it's above a certain threshold, then they start paying a tax. If it's not, then they don't. And so that's some studies have, uh, we talked about this in my class in the course of determinants, that's sort of 
led to competition between some beverages on sort of reducing the sugar, sugary content of their beverages. And that, that's one model that could possibly work. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I haven't heard of that. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, so I will pass it along to Heidi to, to ask one of her questions now. Hi, that's, this is just one of my follow-up comments to that. It was great, great information. Um, but <clears throat> there's actually a, a bill that's being considered um, in Albany, which um, mir kind of mirrors what you said. Um, it is a bill to, I don't know where it is in the process. As you know, a lot of these things kind of sit there for years, uh, which this one has. Um, so it's a process whereby they would um, tax distributors of soda above a certain sugar level, which mm -hmm. I think is interesting in how, how it parallels what you just spoke of. I'm wondering if this particular senator um, Maybe someone took a class of yours <laughs> or, or <laughs> is very astute. Um, but I, I think there is, there is hope. But the issue with the, the United States, as you know, is there's federal and then there's state by state by state. So how would that, would that just impact us here in New York? You, you know, these things are very convoluted and then the relationships are very convoluted with people lobbying. We have a huge lobby, obviously, lobbying probably against that. So. Yeah, where was that, uh, Heidi, that you mentioned? Where was that uh, the initiative, that idea being proposed, the bill? Um, it's in Albany, so New York. In Albany. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 One yeah. of our senators, I forget his name, but I'm I'm signed up for all of his alerts, <laughs> yeah. is uh, is uh, sponsoring that bill. Well, this, as like you mentioned, Heidi, this is a problem with the U.S. is federalism, right? And the in sort of the states, as we saw in California, with now the the reversal of the tax effort in California, right, um, and recently. And, 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 um, and sort of the states being so different politically and in innovation. In New York, we've seen a lot of ideas. We've seen the food labeling. We've seen the menuing, right? We, we see the, all these innovations, but it's, the problem is federalism. Not every state wants to do that. And, there's, and so um, what's interesting in these emerging countries, middle-income countries, like I mentioned, it's a national level initiative. It's only now recently being a subnational, and it's because of the failures of the national level initiative. But uh, but no, we're looking forward to following up and seeing you know taxing distributors, uh, you know, and and of course industry's main argument on taxation is that it's going to affect their their uh, their business, right, and and, and employment. Uh, but as we saw the arguments about that in the Philly tax, that really didn't that's not necessarily happen. You know, the employment in the beverage industry continued and the economy in general continued, there was not that impact, but that's one of the arguments that industry often makes. Uh, but it's good to see that there are different kinds of innovative ideas that are happening. And I can only hope that other, other states uh, really start to follow up. Molly? Yeah, um, something else I've been thinking about is, as you mentioned, um, a lot of these companies uh, advocate through creating job opportunities in, in areas that really need that um, additional economic flow. Um, so how do you recommend for um, either policymakers or just advocates at the ground level um, to reframe that issue, to separate um, these health these health concerns from job security, like how um, how do you suggest that we take away this economic um, concern and maybe tie it into a different issue or just separating it from these health outcomes? Well, I think that, I mean, one thing that Africans can do is certainly increase awareness about what the intentions of these uh, industries may be. Um, and, and one of the challenges, of course, is that in these uh, low and middle income countries uh, where unemployment is so high, right, um, it, you know, activists have a hard time really, you know, emphasizing or questioning um, if it's good to be working with, you know, certain industries, Nestle or other countries, or Coke and sort of the employment opportunities. And, um, and so, but I think that, I think that what activists need to do and researchers need to do sort of to, to raise awareness about this issue and raise awareness about, um, you know, is it a good idea to be doing this? You know, what messages is it giving? Um, but that's, that's, this is the challenge. This is the problem, you know, um, Amali, is that governments, um, 
um, you know, are relying on this employment. Uh, individuals are relying on employment, and these industries are doing a really great job of providing these opportunities. And uh, and how do we how do we separate that? You know, from you know, uh, and how do we how do we from the health impact? I mean, it's a very challenging issue in these in in these kind of contexts. But I think that just increasing awareness and just research and advocacy and and sort of you know, questioning the motives of what these industries are doing um, uh, can sort of help. I think to also kind of build on that and also Heidi's comment earlier, um, right now also um, in New York State, they're trying to pass a bill um, building a nutritional standard for New York State agencies. So any public agencies that are receiving government funding kind of creating a nutritional standard of what food should be offered on, you know, on campus or in those buildings. Um, and that bill would also affect CUNY and SUNY schools. Um, and a part of the original bill, there was kind of like a clause that they wanted to include about um, not allowing uh, universities to go into pouring rights contracts. Um, and essentially for the bill to kind of move on, um, people lobbied against that and that part had to be removed essentially. And so thinking about Pepsi also has headquarters in New York state, they provide a lot of jobs. And so there's probably a lot of lobbying that's also happening on that end. And so it was really interesting kind of just reading your book and seeing what's happening in other countries and being able to draw parallels about what's happening in New York city, New York state, but also, um, you know, on CUNY's campuses. And so, you know, we're at campus, we're also comparing countries, but CUNY has a huge population. There's at least, you know, close to 500,000 if we're talking about students, faculty and staff, and that's a, a little city of its own. And so, um, kind of just talking a little bit about what's happening um, on our campus. The pouring rights contract was signed about 10 years ago. It's coming up for, exp um, it's expiring. So we wanted to kind of um, get people's input in terms of, you know, what should be sold in CUNY's cafeterias? How can we have students kind of be involved in that decision making? And, um, you know, when you describe the, the political and social tactics that industries use in these countries, we can see some of the parallels about what's happening on our campus. And so, you know, the financial incentives is a very strong one. So a part of the contract, um, there was a $21 million sponsorship that was built in over the course of 10 years. Um, you know, Pepsi is offering funding to support sustainable activities, to support health and wellness activities on campus. Um, they're partnering also with students to kind of provide resources for like student clubs and activities, the athletic fund, um, as well as something that they've been um, funding. And so what are some things, um, so over the last two semesters, we've been trying to advocate for better um, campus options for students. Um, and, you know, it's been difficult because there is a lot of things tied up into it, community benefits from the money, especially right now with a lot of like budget cuts that are happening. Um, so it can be hard sometimes to, to convince people that this might not be the best option for students or that we're limiting student choices. Um, so what lessons can we learn from activists abroad that, that have been, um, you know, trying to petition for more of these like preventative regulations that are happening? Um, how can we take some of those lessons and successes abroad and kind of apply it here to our own community? Well, thank you, uh, uh, Iman. I, I, thank you for raising this issue. And, and I, I'm really sorry to say I didn't, I didn't know about this initiative on the CUNY campus. Um, and I think in, in general, you know, the, the whole topic about foods and on university campuses is so different and unique from schools and children. Um, you know, I was recently, we had a lecture by um, uh, Professor Marlene Schwartz at UConn at the Road Center at Lehigh uh, this week um, on Monday, where I asked this question and, and we would, uh, you know, she did this wonderful research on schools. And, and I had this question about universities and others did too. And so what's interesting is that the context is so different because, um, you know, the, you have adult population, not only have students, but you have faculty, you have administrators, right? And, and so it's a different kind of community context, whereas in schools, you know, it's children and the focus has on, been on children. And I really haven't seen a lot of research done on comparing university campuses and regulations to schools and children. And I think that's something that we really need to think more about. In terms of what lessons that, that activists, now in the book, and I have to mention, when I did the research, I really did not see anything about universities in these countries. There was one case in Brazil that I talked about and that I found in my research where the University of Brasilia partnered with, I believe it was Coca-Cola, 
on, on uh, wellness and exercise at the university at, in Brasilia. Um, and that was the only example of where I found a public-private partnership at the university level. Um, a lot of the focus has been on schools and children. And I think, but to get to your question about what tactics, what was interesting in my research is that um, while activism is new in this topic, the activism has really been focused on awareness of importance of soda taxes, awareness of importance of nutrition uh, and exercise, and little, very few examples of activists drawing attention to industry tactics. Um, in Mexico, I think they did a great job of doing that. And Brazil has done a great job of doing that and highlighting for example, uh, how industry tried to interfere with congressional consensus building on the food labels. Uh, and I do recall activists writing about that in the media. So I think the one lesson that can be taken from that is that, you know, that the use of the media and writing about situations and these kinds of situations, also uh, doing research and providing state health officials or health officials with, uh, you know, quality research on these particular issues. I think those have been, in terms of tactics, uh, I think that's been sort of the, the main uh, strategies activists have used uh, in trying to raise awareness um, and, and, and um, about, about the, the issues that they're, that they're worried about. Um, and, um, and so I think that also one thing that Brazil did in the, and in, in activists did under the previous Lula administrations was, they worked hard to make sure that they had a seat at the policymaking table and that they had access to those that are really making decisions. So uh, through the CONSEA, the National Council of Food Security in the Office of the Presidency, activists had a seat at the policy table. This uh, was uh, eliminated under the conservative Bolsonaro administration. Um, and when Lula came back to office, the first thing he did, one of the very first things, literally in the first couple of days of his administration, was to reinstate the National Food Security uh, Council in his office. And what activists did were very committed to ensuring that they had a seat at the app policy table. So I think that that's important, too, is making sure that, 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 that you have a presence where decisions are being made. And I think those are some of the lessons that you know one can draw from the the activist work. But I again, as I talk about, it, it's this is something very new in these emerging uh, economies. Uh, Brazil uh, is very unique in that it had for many many decades a, a women's movement that was committed to nutrition as a human right for children. Uh, this dates back to the 1960s. There's been a long social movement. Um, and a lot of activists that are involved in children's health as a human right. Very, very different uh, from Chile, where, where this social movement is almost, has not been imported for national policies. That's very, this is a different issue. But in other countries that I've talked about, this social movement really is so new that we don't have enough examples of what you know, is, is, is really happening where activists in most of these countries don't have the finances and the, and, and the support they need to come up with innovative ways. So, uh, but I think that that's, that's some ideas and lessons that we could take uh, possibly. Come on. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. That's very um, exciting to hear because I think those are some strategies that we have been trying to work, whether that's working with media um, and trying to get our message out there. Um, and then also what you mentioned at the end, making sure that we have a seat at the table. Um, and that's kind of one of the recommendations that we propose is having students, faculty and staff a part of that decision making and also having voting power because sometimes, you know, these these committees are kind of created um, more on like a superficial level where we provide like advice and research, um, but might not have any voting power. And that's really where the, the decision um, power kind of lies. And so thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Heidi, if you have one or should we take one from the audience? Um, I, th I think we've covered all of my questions, honestly. Thank you so much for asking. Okay. Awesome. So we have one question that just came in um, from Efrain. Thank you for the insightful webinar, Dr. Gomez. Um, humans are guided by self-interest for economic surplus and thus design systems with imperfections and aim to shape the markets of law, regulation, and politics. How can we avoid regulatory capture by industry? 
Uh, this is a very important point, regulatory capture, the conflict of interest. As I talk about in my book, this is something that really is not been addressed in a lot of these countries. Um, Brazil has recently done a really good job in activists and researchers and sort of highlighting and, and prohibiting any kind of industry capture of nutrition associations, uh, nutrition research and realizing uh, that that of course is conflict of interest. But I really have not found a government commitment in all these countries to regulate and monitor conflict of interest and to avoid that within government. I think the AMLO new administration is certainly committed to uh, you know, avoiding conflict of interest and anti-corruption. But this is something that's very new in these countries. I mean, this is something that has not really been addressed is the ethics and the, the monitoring and the regulations and ensuring that there is no industry funded research that, uh, uh, um, that is skewing the data and the science and to limit and to prohibit that this kind of activity. Um, and so, uh, but also regulatory capture entails uh, industry capturing bureaucrats and interests, right? And I think the case of China really shows how dramatic that can be with Isley's infiltration into the Ministry of Health and sort of what, what needs to be done to avoid these issues. Um, and of course, it becomes very complicated in a non-democratic state. So, uh, you know, this is, these are something, these issues are very, very important. Understanding what regulatory capture is, um, understanding of different kinds of regulatory capture, not only working with having officials and representation within in the bureaucracy, uh, but also, you know, uh, any kinds of large East bribes, but also funding research. Uh, these are all different kinds of regulatory capture that really need to be avoided and regulated. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's just not really something that's been focused enough in these emerging uh, markets. Thank you. So we have about a minute left. I just kind of want to um, open it up to you, uh, Dr. Gomez, if there's any last words that you want to say before we um, wrap up any calls to action. Well, thank you so much, Iman. I just I just want to thank everyone for taking the time today. And I hope that my different perspective on political science and, and health has been insightful and, 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 and helped us raise new questions. And I really would just like to emphasize to everyone that for those of us in public health and political science, that we really need to think of how we can ask new questions mm -hmm. uh, about this complex issue and to really focus on sort of looking at all these policies and the role of government and civil society. I think that this is something that's very, very important. And, um, and I just wanna thank all of you for being interested in this approach. And I wanna thank um, uh, you know, Cooney and your center for giving me this wonderful opportunity today. And I'm happy to follow up with any further questions anyone may have. And thank you so much, Iman and uh, Heidi and Molly for all of these wonderful questions today. And I uh, look forward to future conversations. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you. It was really, um, it was really awesome being able to read the book and, like I said, be able to kind of draw comparisons between the work that we've been doing here on campus and also just learn about what's going on abroad. I think we talk a lot about like malnutrition kind of being the issue, and so kind of bringing attention to some of these new public health issues that are arising um, in the rest of the world. And so, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you of, um, to our audience also for joining us this morning, and we will wrap it up here. Have a thank good day, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.